I have stood at the feet of the Christ Redeemer statue on Corcovado Mountain and looked out over the city of Rio de Janeiro and Sugarloaf Mountain on the water, and it was beautiful. I've seen the Grand Canyon, the giant redwood trees and the rock formations of the West, and they were beautiful. I've seen the Pacific Ocean cast crash on the rocks of the California coastline, and it was beautiful. I've seen Tokyo, Japan at night with all its lights and technology, and it was beautiful. I've seen a starry night on the dunes of Canoa Quebrada in Brazil, and it was beautiful. I've seen the mountains of the Twin Peaks in Salt Lake City, and it was beautiful. I've seen the castles of Germany and the waters of Venice and the villages of Romania, Romania, and, and they were all, all of those things were very, very beautiful. But though my eyes cannot yet behold the sight, and though with great frustration my mind and heart cannot form the picture, none of these sights hold a candle to the beauty of Jesus. We continue our Worship Because series today with Worship Because King Jesus is beautiful. Would you turn your Bibles please to Psalm 45. Psalm 45. Psalm 45 in the scriptures. All right, sounds like most of you have gotten there. Would you stand, please? Let's read this incredible psalm. It says, My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made or I have created in my mind, touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured unto thy lips, into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most, high, most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces, whereby they have made thee glad. King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in the gold of Ophir. Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy lord, and worship thou him. And the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall, shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy fathers shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. You may be seated. Spurgeon said of this psalm, Some see Solomon and Pharaoh's daughter only. They are short-sighted. Others see both Solomon and Christ. They are cross-eyed. Well-focused spiritual eyes see here Jesus only. Or if Solomon be present at all, it must be like those hazy shadows of passerby which cross the face of the camera 
and therefore are dimly traceable upon a photographic landscape. All of us have seen pictures where someone is going fast or in the distance and they're blurred and they're not the focus. C.S. Lewis, the famous English author, said of this psalm that some psalms were meant for two things. He wrote that Psalm 45 was a good example of this. He thought that Psalm 45 meant one thing before Jesus came to earth and quite another thing after he came. We really do not need to wonder, folks, as we read this, and I know that there's, there's, there's many things as I read this, I realize that I've had a long time to dwell on this passage and to think it through. And it is a glorious passage, and it will be if you stick with me to the end. And I know that there's a lot of things in, in this passage that uh, are like, well, what does that mean, and what does that mean? You stick with me to the end, and you'll see it, and it'll be glorious to you. We really don't need to wonder what, who this passage is talking about, because right in the middle of the chapter, there is a quotation out of the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, that is directly speaking about Jesus Christ. This chapter is about Jesus Christ. This is a prophetic chapter showing the beauty of Christ. This psalm by beautiful literature presents Jesus in a very poetic way that awakens our senses with several romantic and, and appreciative realizations of him. But we need to understand that these things are not merely physical beauties to our senses that we read about Christ. In fact, the scripture says that he has no form or comeliness, that is beauty, that there wasn't anything in his physical body that we should see him and desire him. No, the beauty that is in Psalm 45 and many of the prophetic psalms are a deeper beauty than that. It is his character, Jesus' character of perfection, of his grace, of his obedience to his Father, of his compassion, of his love, of his sense of perfect righteousness, of the truth that comes out of his lips. It is righteous beauty that should make our hearts adore him this morning and worship him all the more. And that kind of beauty is more fair than physical beauty that fades away. This is a righteous beauty of staring at Jesus Christ this morning and worshiping him. Now, please notice the introduction in verse number one. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. The king. There he is. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You see right, right away that the, the inspired author here, from his heart, this is, a, this is a, a psalm that he is writing that is out of worship. He the verse 1 talks about being ma made. He, he thought of these thoughts, and he was so overwhelmed by these thoughts about the king that he begins writing them down. It says that he is indicting this matter, or, or that he's indicting a good matter. That means gushing. It means that in his heart, he was thinking these things about the king, and it was gushing out of him. And he had to grab a pen, and he had to write these things down. He was being moved by the inspiration of the God, Scripture of God, to write these things. And they were glorious to him. It was a matter of worship. In his heart, he was worshiping the king. And these words may have had some immediate meaning, or perhaps Solomon or the kingship of whatever was there, but there is no question that they have far more meaning for us about King Jesus. And here, right away, in verse number two, is our proposition for the rest of this psalm. And the point, notice verse number two, thou art fairer. I want you to say that out loud, real loud, so we're all focused in. Here we go. Thou art fairer. One more time. Thou art fairer. The word fair means bright and beautiful. King Jesus, who is, is being described here, is more beautiful than any man. The verse here says that grace is poured into his lips. Certainly, everything that he was, everything that he did, everything that he said was full of grace. Instead of condemning billions of hellbound sinners that rebelled against him and his father, instead of condemning them, instead of wiping them out, rather he became one of us, taught us, showed us his grace to us, provided the rescue for us. No, he was no mere man. He was fairer than any man. He was no near man, mere man that once in a while shows grace to somebody else. He was full of grace. He was and is full of grace. Jesus, what a friend of sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. John said it this way, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. That is, grace upon grace. Grace that is pouring down upon grace by Jesus Christ. He is fairer. Thou art fairer. 
We see then in the verses three things that describe how Jesus Christ is so beautiful and how he is so fair. How this king is beautiful in his glory. Number one, King Jesus is a mighty warrior. You look please at verse number three through five. The scripture says this, gird thy sword upon thy thigh. O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. Three things there. It's the banner that he rides under. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. That means horrible, powerful things Jesus' right hand does. Tremendous defensiveness of holiness. Tremendous things. Verse number five. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. King Jesus, number one, is a mighty warrior. The king comes in grace in verse number two. But for those who reject him, please understand, he will be a terrible warrior, defending righteousness and defending God's holiness and defending God's justice and authority. You know, in our Sunday school class, my Sunday school class, the New Believers Grounding class, we were talking about the form of God this morning. You know, there's a lot of ideas about who God is. And many of those ideas and forms of God that are being taught in different churches or whatever, they do not take their, their specifics from the word of God, but men create the form of God who they think God is. Please understand, yes, God is God of love and mercy and, right, and, and righteousness and goodness and grace, but please understand that he is also a God of holiness and a God of justice. And Jesus Christ, for those who reject his grace, will enforce the righteous justice of God. The Bible says about the end days in Romans 19, talking about Jesus Christ, the great and mighty warrior, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. That is Christ in the end day. No longer the Lamb, but the Lion of Judah. I was praying this morning and just thinking about how Satan is a fake lion. Says he's a roaring lion seeking whom he made about. He's just a poser. There is one lion. He is the Lion of Judah. And that great Lion of Judah is going to Bite, bite the back and break the back of the fake lion. Jesus Christ, when he comes, will come as a mighty warrior. But in several ways, folks, right now, the beauty of Jesus Christ is he is right now our mighty warrior. Yes, that's going to happen in the end day. Yes, we're going to look for that great day that, that Jesus Christ comes in power. But right now, Christ is this warrior who has girded his sword upon his thigh for us by his gospel words of Scripture. He is defeating and overcoming ignorance and rebellion in the hearts of his enemies by saving them. He is overthrowing the war that is churning within people because of their sin by his gospel words. He is creating a new kingdom within their heart, the kingdom of God within them. He is saving those who will believe on him and establishing his glory and majesty on the throne of their hearts. Right now, Jesus Christ is the mighty warrior, overcoming rebellion and establishing his kingdom in our hearts, in the hearts of those that he saves. Let me ask you, has King Jesus, the warrior, conquered your heart? Have you put up the flag of surrender? As he tells you in your heart that you have sinned against God, and that he is coming one day to judge you, unless you surrender right now and believe on his cross and his resurrection, unless you accept his grace and his love. Have you surrendered to the great warrior, Jesus Christ? He wants to make you a new person. He wants to make a new person out of you that doesn't live for self and sin, but changes your life to a new, different life. It makes you lay down the fists of rebellion. It changes your life by regeneration, by becoming born again. And he wants to sit on the throne of your heart. He allowed himself to be crucified to absorb your guiltiness. And now he wants to be your master, your Lord, your king. Stop resisting him. As the old preacher said, your arms are too short to box with God. Who can resist the great king that straps on the sword on his thigh? The great warrior, King Jesus. King Jesus is also 
presently the warrior of injustice in your life, the lies of his children, and the enemies of those who oppose you. When God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, King Jesus is that warrior interacting in our lives, interacting in this culture to repay. He's not dormantly sitting at the Father's right hand. He is active. You remember the scripture says that when we cry to him for need for help, he is a succorer or succor. He comes to the aid. He comes to the help. He is your warrior right now of injustice in your life. He's a beautiful warrior. Please notice he is riding in verse number three as a warrior with glory and majesty. Because he is perfectly righteous and he is the creator and the authority of the universe, he made this universe, he must enforce that righteousness of being this warrior. Let me just say it this way. I want you, I want you to understand where I came from, come from. It says in these verses, verse 3, that he has glory and his majesty, and that's part of him strapping on that sword and enforcing righteousness. It's not enough just for God, for Christ, to be righteous. He must ultimately make everything around him righteous. It's not enough for him to say, okay, I am righteous, but the world can do, you can do whatever you want to do in your life. No, he is the ultimate authority. He is your creator. He is the ultimate judge. And he must strap on that sword of justice. Everything must bow to his glory. And what a joy that is to us. And what a promise, the beautiful promise and picture that all the wrongs are going to be made right. What a beautiful thing it is that everything that has been done wrong and taken advantage of and done sinfully and the curse of the world will be made right by the warrior. What a wonderful thing that Jesus Christ will conform this world and culture to his righteous self. He will do it by force. What a beautiful king. Please see King Jesus as a prosperous warrior. Verse number four. Notice it says, look there with your eyeballs. Don't look at me. It's beautiful in the text. It says, prosperously. He's going to ride prosperously. His right hand, the scripture says here, will do terrible things. This is horrible things. You know, the, uh, mighty things. The scripture says in verse 5 that his arrows are sharp in the heart of his enemies. You got the picture there? Thunk. The heart of his enemies. What is this all talking about? It means that Jesus will succeed. And he will always succeed. And no one can stand against him. He will win the day. Satan and sin may win some battles in human history or in this history, but Jesus will win the war. And I say amen again and again and again. And you had better know that. You better stir your heart. I'll come off this pulpit and I want to tell you what. I want to tell you, this psalm is incredible. My heart is just, I feel so inadequate to preach it. See Jesus here. See the beauty of Jesus, the power and the glory of Jesus. Listen to what Gary Joyne sang to you. Stand in the awe of Christ. He will win the war. The great, psalm, or the great song says, this is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. The battle was not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be won. Because Jesus Christ is righteous, and he is the great authority and the great creator and the judge, he must make everything around him like himself, conform to himself. Notice, please, the cause that King Jesus rides for as he wars against the wrong. I guess you can imagine this great warrior, and he has a banner. And the banner's up there, and three things are on the banner. This is the cause that he is riding, he is riding for as he as he stands up for righteousness. It is, in verse number four, read it, it says, and in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. This is why he rides against his enemies. He is standing for the truth that they have trampled. He is avenging the meek they have taken advantage of. He is riding for righteousness to reign where darkness and wickedness prevails. This is, what, this is why he's coming. This is why he is on the move. What a beautiful warrior he is. He is our hero. He is our captain. He's the hope of every weary soul that is in this auditorium this morning that longs for the better day. Take heart. Take heart. The king is girding on his sword. Take heart. It won't always be like this. 
In fact, don't just think of it, the fact that someday he'll gird on his sword. No, he is our mighty warrior right now. He is on the move now. I want to tell you one thing. When Christ, the beautiful warrior, rides in that final day, you want to ride with him on the white horses. You don't want to be against him. Give him your life right now. There's a second picture here of Jesus' beauty. It's found in verse 6 and 7. King Jesus is divine and righteous. He is divine and righteous. Look what it says. Thy throne, O God. Now, you've got to understand, this is, it's, it's clear in Hebrews 1. This is God the Father speaking to the Son now. He'll speak to him in the middle here, and he'll, he'll come again at verse 16 and 17 and talk to him again. He says, the Father says to the Son, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. You know, a king's scepter that he holds, okay? It's a sign of his rule. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. King Jesus is divine and righteous. These verses, especially verse 6, holds a very special meaning to me. Because as a teenage boy, I struggled with the question, is Jesus God? And in Hebrews 1, that I've referred to a couple of times, there's a day I can remember it on my bed when I was reading my Bible as a teenage boy, and I read these verses re-quoted in Hebrews 1, 1. God the Father, it makes very clear there, the Father's talking to the Son and says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Listen, if, G, excuse me, if God the Father knows that His Son and calls His Son God, who am I to question that? Jesus Christ is God, very God. He is the divine king. Imagine God himself ruling among men. God came as a man to be our savior, and now he sits on the throne of our hearts to rule his kingdom, and one day he will return physically to rule as the God king on the earth, and what a beautiful day that will be. Will the divine king rule like Toronto Mayor Rob Ford? Spouting slurred foolishness in a fast food restaurant? Is that what King Jesus will be like? <laughs> will it even be like our greatest leaders of history whose administrations are still in some private areas tainted by a certain level of scandal or question? We've had great leaders in American history and world history, but none of them have been like King Jesus. No, no, his scepter, the verses say, is a right scepter. When requoted in Hebrews 1, it's a scepter of righteousness. Everything that Jesus does now, on the throne of your heart, ruling your life, then, very publicly, everything that he does, everything that he says, everything he decides is righteous, is upright, is clean, is pure, is good, is always the right thing. Verse 7 says that he loves righteousness. Jesus loves righteousness. You know, and I'll just push the pause button and step over here because I'm just focusing you on worshiping Jesus. But there's a lot of things in this passage where we can mimic him. And here's one of, a, one of them. To love righteousness. And the next phrase, to hate wickedness. To love righteousness. Step back in. In the backdrop of the leaders uh, out, that are out for prideful power and gain and greed and fame, leaders that we know, governors, presidents, mayors, whatever, there is compassionate, righteous Jesus. The backdrop of all that scandal and all that wrong motives, we look at Christ. He's rightly the king, but he's on his knees washing feet. He's taking no reputation. He's having no earthly wealth or place even to lay his head. The foxes have places to lay their heads, he said, but the Son of Man doesn't. He is honest. He is true, he is fair, he is gracious, he is humble, he is just with everyone. He's the divine and righteous king. Please don't misunderstand, he is not soft. The verse says in verse 7, he hates wickedness. He will certainly rule with a rod of iron in the end day, but he will not be cruel. He will not give out more than is rightly deserved. He hates everything that smacks of unrighteousness. And can you imagine, folks, listen to me, that every decision, every law, every response, every direction, every ruling of leadership will be righteous? 
that beautiful day is coming. And that's the beauty of what King Jesus is. Now notice the little statement at the end of verse number 7. It says, therefore, or we can say this, because of these things, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Because of Jesus' character of righteousness, the scripture says, therefore, because you're so righteous, because you love righteousness, because you hate wickedness, Jesus, therefore, now look, it's coming to exaltation, but we have to understand that Jesus is not exalted in the last day only because of who he is, the Son of God. It's because of what he did. It's because of the character traits he displayed when he came to earth. It says, because you love righteousness and you hate wickedness, because of your character of righteousness, because your perfectly perfect uh, earthly life was a life of righteousness, because of every righteous decision uh, that you made as you went to the cross for mankind, because of that, the Godhead will highly exalt you and anoint you and reward you with the oil of gladness. And the verse is talking about the day and the whole plan of God, really, that's been all along to exalt Jesus Christ and to lift up Jesus Christ, all of our history of the universe, from the conception of in the beginning God was for the purpose of lifting up Jesus Christ in his righteousness and in his beauty. He has earned joyful exaltation. Hebrews 12, 2 says it this way, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our, of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is exalted, and he will be exalted with the oil of gladness. He is excited about this. He knew that it was going to happen. He lived a beautiful and a wonderful life, and I don't want to say it this way, but you have to understand it's written this way. Because of the joy set before him, all these incredible Righteous decisions were made, and he lived in such grace and wonder. He knew that the Godhead would highly exalt him, and it would be a great joy to him. He is anointed with gladness, the scriptures say here, above his fellows. Perhaps the verse is speaking about angels, in whose presence he lived as the word before he came out of those ivory palaces. Perhaps this means fellow men, who be, he became life, like that the Godhead would exalt him with the oil of gladness above those fellows, those men that he became like, humanity. Whatever it means, in the presence of all, he is exalted with great joy. Joy to him, and joy to God, and joy to us that will share in that anointing oil of blessing. Now get the picture, I think this is great. You know, in the end days, it's pictured that as Jesus Christ is exalted, that the Godhead is going to pour the oil, the anointing oil of gladness on his head, but that oil spills off. And that oil of exaltation, he doesn't just allow himself to be exalted. He exalts us along with him. That beautiful oil of exaltation spills out and dabs on you. It spills over on you, his grace and blessing. Because he is exalted, you will be exalted. The beautiful, beautiful king. He is right now and will forever be the beautiful, divine king of righteousness. Now, folks, for perhaps the most beautiful point of this passage to us, is point number three, King Jesus is our beautiful groom. Our beautiful groom. You know, we have, we've had some weddings you know, recently, and there's some weddings coming of folks in our church, and it's just, you see all that fanfare or whatever, and most of those things that happen in the wedding from the entrance of the bride the whole thing most of it was taken from cues of scripture uh, about the marriage between Christ and the church and the ultimate marriage and the marriage supper of the lamb when we will be recognized as the bride of Christ a lot of those things uh, you know the bride wears white for a reason and that comes from scripture and many of those things are that picture well I want your mind your imagination and your worship to go to this pic picture that King Jesus is our beautiful groom. Get in your mind the picture of a marriage. I want to read verse 8 through 11, and I want you to think wedding. All thy garments smell of myrrh, verse 8, and aloes and cassia, out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir, 
Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. I don't know if you can see it, but here in these verses and following, there is a wedding. And there are people there. It's a wedding party. There is a ceremony where the, the groom loves the bride. There is a, a, a pronouncement of, of marriage here. Verse 8 begins that Jesus walked out of the ivory palaces of heaven, clothed as a groom searching for his bride. You know that hymn? Do you guys know that hymn? Out of the ivory palaces into a world of woe. And there's other words too, but I don't particularly remember them right now. The hymn writer understood that this passage was talking about Christ as he walked out of his beautiful palaces of heaven and made himself of no reputation. This is the groom who left his home looking for his bride. It's a picture of his incarnation. He came smelling in his perfection as beautiful as the ancient perfumes of myrrh and aloes and cassia could describe him. And all of these three were anointing perfumes used in this context as colognes for the garments of Jesus Christ, the great groom. And God is appealing to all your senses in this passage. And he wants you to smell the beauty of Christ, not just see it this morning, but to smell the beauty of Christ who came for us. Again, at the end, in verse number eight, we see Jesus' joy in coming for his bride, his gladness. It says, whereby they have made thee glad. He is happy to claim his bride. Verse number nine through 11 describes the actual joining of a wedding ceremony as you look at it. You see the king's daughters mentioned, and you see someone else, his queen, and this really, folks, describes, don't get stuck here. I'm going to explain this a little bit later. But don't get stuck here. This all describes the redeemed of every age that are there at the wedding. The great church, the body, uh, and the bride of Christ that are joined together. Daughters, we are children of God, and the bride of Christ. The, the scripture said here, it says here, we will be clothed in the gold of Ophir. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, the people who read this psalm understood what that meant. You know, the purest gold at that point was said to come from this place, Ophir. In fact, some of you will remember that Solomon literally got a boatload of gold from this place, Ophir. And so what it's describing here is this incredible pure gold that one day we will be clothed in, this beautiful gold as the bride of Christ, by his own beauty, by Jesus' own beauty, his own purity, his own righteousness, Christ has made us his bride as pure gold. He has clothed us blameless in the righteousness of Christ, in the purity of Christ. You say, Pastor, you don't know what I am. No, I don't know what you are, and I don't know what you have been, but I know what the blood of Jesus Christ does for you. It makes you as pure as the purest of gold that they could mention in this passage. King Jesus' bride will be as pure as the purest gold. He presents us, and he will present us to himself, the scripture says. He thinks of us right now, those of us who are saved. And he will present us as a blameless people, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Is it because of our performance? Is it because we can live perfectly? Is it because we are good in and of ourselves? It is only by the blood of Jesus Christ that has made us blameless and righteous. We are glorious to him. The bride wears white. And what is our response to this in the middle of the wedding? What is our response? Well, what's the response in the middle of a wedding? I do. Do you take? I do. Look at verse number 10. It says, hearken, O daughter. Give attention. Listen, O daughter, O bride, and consider and incline thine ear. Listen to the groom. Forget also thine own house, thy people, and thy father's house. Do you understand that? Is anybody picking up on the wedding, the marriage analogy? You leave your father and your mother and you cleave you know, to your spouse, and the two are one. This is the illusion here. We're married to Christ. Forget the past. Forget the sin. Forget your background. Forget the sinful world and the sinful culture around you. Leave that. Leave your father, your past father, the devil, and go to Jesus. Listen to the groom. 
Hearken to the groom. Focus on the groom. Verse 11 says, King Jesus greatly desires our beauty. You see the groom staring at the ride. He made us. He has made us beautiful after all. And he desires our beauty. He is our Lord. And the verse ends, worship thou him. Bride of Christ, put all your focus on the groom. Bride of Christ, forget lesser things in your life. Forget all these things that you make so so very important in your life. And focus on your groom. Hearken to your groom. Love your groom. Worship your groom. And so we must. Jesus Christ, King Jesus, is the beautiful focus of our Christian lives. Folks, listen, let me just say this. If you focus on Jesus Christ and what he loves and mimicking him and being like him and worshiping him, you're not not going to have a problem with the commands and the rules of Scripture because you're going to love the groom. You're going to hearken to the groom. You're going to be close to the groom, and you're going to do the things that he loves naturally and out of worship, not out of keeping a book of rules, out of Love and out of appreciation and hearkening to Jesus. As a grateful bride consecrated to her husband, leaving mother and father, so much more we leave our past of sin and our father the devil and we cling to the king, Christ, our groom. We hearken to him, we listen to him, we lean into him to hear what he wants on a daily basis. We delight in what he delights in. We delight that we are now beautiful, the scripture says to him. Verse 12 speaks about the wedding celebration, I guess we would call it the reception. I remember we opened presents at our reception. There was this very irritating little girl who I think we have on video. I'm not going to look at Amy. I'm trying to have a good attitude. And we were opening the presents. They don't really do that much anymore. They don't that's not a big thing. Do you guys remember some of you when it was a big thing? You know, you open your presents and all the people, you could see that, you know, that crystal platter that you'll never, ever use in your life. And we opened our presents there, and this little girl, she just was interested in seeing what these gifts were. And she just pressed closer and closer out of the crowd, right up to basically our kneecaps. And just like, then she put her hand and started opening some gifts herself. That's Stop, little girl. Where's this little girl's daddy? Tell her to go back to the... I just had to wake you up because I want you to see verse number 12 is about bringing gifts to this great marriage. It says, And the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. There's this daughter of Tyre mentioned here. Queenly sort of, yes. It's coming with a gift to the, to the wedding. Tyre at this time was the mecca of finance. It was, our, it was what our Wall Street would be. It was the place that finance happened. And it pictures a time that the scripture talks about in the book of Revelation of the new Jerusalem, that all the nations and the kings of the world will bring their glory, the scripture says, to Christ like gifts, giving him honor and homage to Christ the king and his bride. I don't understand what it all means, but I can tell you it's going to happen. What a reception, what a time of glory for Jesus Christ, the great king, our groom. Now look at the beauty of how Christ has made us in verse 13, 16. The eyes of the passage turn to the bride for just a moment. It says the king's daughter is all glorious within. I wonder how she got that way. Hello, the cross. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions, this is a wedding party that that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. They'll go and live with him. She, she's the queen's going to go home and live with him, happily ever after. There's much here, but don't be confused, as I said, about the difference between the king's daughter and the, queen, and, and the king's queen or his bride. This is just good theology here in this poetry. We are both the children of Christ. We are the daughters of the king as well as the bride of of Christ. You understand that, right? This is not hard. This is New Testament theology. It's straight out of the New Testament. Our identity is rightly mingled between being his child and being his bride. We're both. Notice verse number 13. The scripture says, Christ has made us all glorious within. The king chose, has chosen peasants 
It's like one of those good fairy tales that you read where, you know, the, the prince, he sneaks out of his house and he finds some dirty street urchin, you know, girl and they end up getting married and all that kind of stuff. Well, that doesn't usually work in real circles like that, but it, 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 it worked in salvation. The king has chosen peasants, all dirty and dingy with sin to make his glorious bride. Jesus cleaned us up, not just on the outside, but Romans 5 says where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Where your sin abounded, with everything you can think about why you're not glorious within, and everything you can think about why, the, why you don't are worth being the bride of Christ, and you don't deserve to be, and you don't know how he can say that you're as pure as gold, where all that abounds in your life right now, I want you to understand something. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you are glorious within. Positionally, in the view of God the Father, and in the, in the view of, of Christ, you are blameless before him because of his incredible imputed righteousness. That is righteousness that he gave you. He lived a perfect life for you because you can't. And he, he looks at you, and he doesn't say, what at all, what a filthy bride, where did I get her, man, I, you know, he doesn't say that. He says, you're beautiful, because you're saved. He looks at you and says, you're glorious within. I have made you glorious within. King Jesus has made us glorious on the inside by regeneration of his cross and will make us glorious on the outside soon and very soon. You looking forward to that day? I heard a testimony by, uh, by Johnny. You know, I've referred to this before, I think. I told this story. Johnny, the girl in the wheelchair who dove and her, her neck was broken and God used her, has used her in tremendous ways for his honor and his glory. And she says, some people are looking at me and thinking that the thing that I am looking for about heaven most is to get out of this wheelchair. And, and she said, that is not true. What I'm looking for is to get rid of these temptations and this sin nature. What a day when we, by practice, will be glorious the way that Jesus' blood has made us within by salvation. What a day that will be. What a day when every inclination of Toby Whitmer, motive inside and outside, will only be for the honor and the glory of the king. We'll wait for that day, but Jesus Christ says that right now his bride is all glorious within. Who are these, verse 14, be virgins, her companions, that are rejoicing at this, this wedding celebration as they enter the king's palace? Perhaps they are Israel. I do not know. Finally rejoicing in, in the salvation of the church that came to Christ. Right now, begrudging anyone else that who is the apple of Jehovah's eye, but then rejoicing with us. Perhaps it is the tribulation saints that were saved in those final hours as they refused to take the mark and they stood up and claimed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and their heads were lopped off. They were great martyrs. They will be great martyrs for Christ. I do not know who this party is. We do not know, but the scene is of great eternal joy as the marriage of King Jesus and his bride is realized. We were given one last entity in verse number 16. Look at it. God the Father again chimes in and begins talking to the Son in the last two verses. He says, Instead of thy fathers shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. Now what's that mean? It's talking about priority. It's talking about preference. It's talking about who will be exalted. As we look at scripture and in Jewish history, Israel's history, and even us today, you know, we look at these great fathers of the past in Scripture. We look at Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses. And they're all great patriarchs in their own right. But in that final day, folks, the children of the king, who is his bride, the church, will be exalted to reign with him as princes ruling alongside of King Jesus. In that day, we'll not be looking back at who was exalted before, we will be exalted as kings and priests to our God. We will be the ones who will be enjoying the oil of gladness along with Christ. To think of that day is going to take your spiritual imagination. To let the joy of that day move you to worship this morning is going to take the Holy Spirit. But to think of that day is like thinking of another world. It's like imagining a Narnia. 
where we're going to be kings and priests to our God. When King Jesus will rule in all his glory, and we will rule with him. And I say, even so come, Lord Jesus. Even so come, beautiful groom, and claim your bride. Jesus Christ, you are glorious, and you are beautiful. You're the great warrior. You're the divine king of righteousness. King Jesus, you are our beautiful groom. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Jehovah himself ends this look at beautiful King Jesus with one final verse of praise to his son, our king and groom. And he says, verse 17, I will make thy name, Jesus. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. And here's our application and here's our conclusion. Praise beautiful King Jesus forever and ever. All you people in this place this morning, stir your hearts in all of King Jesus. Stop looking down and start looking up. Stop looking inside at your own depravity. Look outside to what Jesus Christ is saying, that you are the all-glorious bride that I've made glorious within. With full surrender and swelling hearts, hearken to your groom, as the scripture says here. Hearken to your king. Leave your own people and past and father's house behind you with lesser things. See Christ in all his beauty as better than anything this world has to offer. And go from this place worshiping him. Would you bow your heads please this morning?